Shalom, holy initiates and holy adepts. A uh, critical prerequisite for this video is the recent video that I did entitled The Great Arcanum and Secret Behind Sefer HaZohar, in which I reveal the greatest arcanum and mystery behind Sefer HaZohar that has been only known to the Holy Illuminati since its redaction. Very, very powerful secret. And in that video, I gave some very general loose points um, to prove to you uh, uh, and indicate to you this, this great arcanum uh, and mystery. Now, my biggest fear is that many of you who are watching are watching and listening have not mastered our ancient Midrashim and Talmudim and have not even mastered the entire text of the Sefer HaZohar. And these are sort of very critical momentous prerequisites to begin to understand uh, this great arcanum uh, and mystery that I revealed behind Sefer HaZohar. And so uh, initially that video was was done mostly for very, very advanced initiates and adepts. Um, and I fear that there's there were not that many. So I decided to do a follow-up to that video in which I'm going to go a little deeper, get a little bit more technical, in giving some of the seals and proofs from the texts themselves to give you a better, more lucid understanding of this great arcanum and mystery, which is probably one of the most powerful arcanum uh, or, or of the arcana in this last generation. Um, again, it has only been known by the Holy Illuminati. And in this last generation, the Holy Illuminati is solely comprised of 144 individuals to which I belong to. Now, we will begin the first critical foundation to this arcanum and mystery in the ancient uh, Talmudim, specifically in Talmud Yerushalayimi, in Tractrate Ta'anith, chapter 4, verse 8, or Folio 68d. Now, this uh, verse that I'm citing from Talmud Yerushalayimi is, is a very good verse in demonstrating who Rab Shimon Bar Yochai is, right? We have to understand that, yes, Rab Shimon Bar Yochai is a very ancient historical figure from about the first century AD, right around the Second Temple uh, period, okay? So he lived about 2,000 years ago, very close to the time of Yeshua HaMashiach. This is very critical to understand and know. Now, Shimon Bar Yochai, this ancient historical figure, Rab Shimon Bar Yochai, figures very prominently in all of our exoteric, the key word here is exoteric, ancient Jewish literature, okay? Now, in this verse we read, Rash taught, Rab Akiba used to expound, Ochochab goes out from Yaakov, quoting Sefer Bamidbar, chapter 24, verse 17. Uh, verse 17. Now the word Ochochab is the Hebrew word for star. And then it states, Chosba goes out from Yaakov. When Akiba saw Bar Chosba, he said, this is King Mashiach. So here we have uh, Rab Akiba main, main, main teaching that Rab Chosba is Mashiach, right? So we know from history, if you've, studied the Tal if you've mastered or studied the ancient Talmudim, ancient Jewish history, etc., you should know as a matter of fact that Rab Akiba is considered one of our most preeminent sages of the Second Temple period, okay? Literally, he is considered one of the greatest sages. In fact, according to many, uh, according to many Jews throughout the past 2,000 years, much of Judaism actually considers Rab Akiba to be the greatest sage of around the Second Temple period, right? If we, you know, he's considered maybe one of the top three greatest sages of the Second Temple period. Some, there are many Jews um, in Judaism for the past 2,000 years, there are many that actually teach and believe that Rabbi Kiba is, was actually the greatest sage of the past 2,000 years, okay? That's how great this, this, this Rab and sage was and is. And there is no question that he was a, 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 a very great sage and that he was highly initiated. There's no question about this, okay? And the biggest problem is that as intelligent as he may have been, as wise as he may have been, he believed Bar Chosba, also known as Bar Chokhba, to be Mashiach. 
And we know from history that Bar Chokhba was not Meshach, that he was he was a false Mashiach. And so Rav Akiba believed on a false Mashiach, and yet he was a very preeminent sage. This is the danger that I'm always warning everyone about. I've done a uh, I've done a video where I where I, I gave some scriptural proofs um, and precedents uh, for this great warning and this great danger. You know that. I don't care how initiated you are, I don't care how wise you are, how smart you may be, you have, still have to be very careful. You still have to be on your feet because you you can you can be spiritually blind and not know it. It's not about what you know, it's about what you don't know. That's the scary part. And we have a prime example of this with Rabbi Kiba. Here you have one of the most initiated Kabbalists and sages of the Second Temple period. And as wise and as intelligent as he was, he mucked up really big time. He led hundreds of thousands of, of Israelites to their death because he was spiritually blind and was deceived and really, really screwed up big time in calling out a false Mashiach. Okay? So you have to be very, very careful. And I'm always looking down upon so many Jews and so many Christians who get so caught up in being on a high horse, thinking they're so intelligent, thinking they're so wise, thinking they're so initiated, and they don't even know how much spiritual blindness um, and ignorance they um, you know they have I guess you could say that you know so it's it's just you have to be really careful it's it's uh, something that I'm always always warning about and something you should always be thinking about praying about and meditating about and and praying to Elohim you know show me if I ha if there's any spiritual blindness within me if I'm ignorant about anything if I if I hold any erroneous beliefs you know if I'm doing anything erroneous you know because you know it's it's something that is it's one of the most momentous things that should be at the top of your spiritual list and always um, worrying about and, and and making sure that you're not engaging in okay. So this is a perfect example of this. Now, here from this from this Talmudic folio, we learn that uh, that Rashbi was a disciple of Rab Akiba. He was actually one of one of Rab Akiba's disciples, and Shimon Bar Yochai is also considered another very preeminent uh, ancient sage of around the Second Temple period. Right? We have a number of preeminent sages that figure very prominently in our ancient Jewish literature. And so from this verse, we learn, you know, one, that Rashbi is a disciple of Rabbi Kiba and that Rabbi Kiba believed Bar Chokhba to be a uh, Mashiach, even though he wasn't. Okay, so then this begs the question, if Rashbi was Akiba's disciple, did he too believe that Bar Chokhba was Mashiach? Well, Rashbi lived after that fact. So he would, Rashbi would have seen that his teacher's belief in this Mashiach was actually incorrect. Okay, so what's the point in all of this? The point is, that Rashbi is just one of many very preeminent sages that figures very prominently in our ancient Jewish literature. If you have mastered all of our ancient exoteric Jewish literature, the only thing you would know about Rashbi is that he's a very preeminent sage and doesn't stand out too much apart from all of the other sages that figure prominently in our exoteric Jewish literature. That's all you would know, okay? So very, very important to understand, okay? Not to mention the fact that there have been many Jews that actually would would based just based off the, off of our Jewish exoteric literature alone, there are many Jews that would would believe and go as far as to state that Rab Akiva is actually a greater sage than Rab Shimon Bar Yochai. So, from all of our exoteric Jewish literature, you know, Rashbi is just one of many very preeminent sages, and that's really about it. There's nothing too special about Rab Shimon Bar Yochai. You know, if you're just, if all you know is our ancient exoteric Jewish literature. Okay, so. That all changes when you enter our e very esoteric uh, ancient uh, Jewish treatises uh, and texts. Okay. So it's very, very important to understand. We must understand here from, we must establish this preliminary foundation that strictly, just strictly from, from, from the perspective of our ancient exoteric Jewish literature vis-a-vis -vis the Talmudim and the Midrashim, etc., 
Rashbi is just one of many ancient eminent sages from around the Second Temple period who was a disciple of Rab Akiba. Okay? And very critical to also understand is that many Jews would consider Akiba greater than Rab Shimon Bar Yochai. Okay? Very, very momentous to establish this very preliminary foundation. Okay? Because all of this is going to radically very powerfully and very radically change the moment we engage and become initiated into our ancient esoteric Kabbalistic texts. Okay? So, all of a sudden, we, you become initiated into the Holy Mysteries and you master and read all of Sefer HaZohar. Now, all of a sudden, you enter the world of the Zohar and our esoteric treatises, and Rashbi is all of a sudden a divine figure. In our exoteric ancient Jewish literature, Rashbi is a mere mortal. But in our esoteric Jewish literature, Rashbi is a divine figure, and he is the most initiated Kabbalist of the Second Temple period. So in our esoteric Jewish text, all of a sudden, Rashbi is transformed from a mere mortal, a mere eminent sage of the Second Temple period to the most initiated Kabbalist of the Second Temple period, who is a divine figure, who is also Mashiach and the son of, of God. He's all of this and much more. How did this happen? How can we say this about Rashbi? Here you are an Orthodox Jew. You've mastered all of the ancient exoteric Jewish literature. You've read about Rashbi in all of the Midrashim and the Talmudim, and you only know him as just one of many preeminent sages of the Second Temple period. That's all you know of him. You've never read anywhere that he's the son of God, that he's the Mashiach, that he's a divine figure, that he's the most initiated Kabbalist of the Second Temple period. There's nothing of this sort in our exoteric Jewish literature about Rashbi. And yet that all changes when you enter our ancient esoteric Jewish texts. Very radical transformation. How and why? That was the whole purpose of, the, of my first video on this topic. Now, listen very, very carefully. Meditate very carefully because I'm now going to proceed to read to you a few folios from Sefer HaZohar that prove and demonstrate all of this. Okay? Now, we read in Sefer HaZohar in the Idra Rabba, which is a very esoteric section within the Zohar. In Book 3 in Folio 132b, it states, Furthermore, and by the way, this is Rashbi speaking. He states, Furthermore, I know that my face is shining, whereas Moshe did not know or see as it is written. Moshe did not know that the skin of his face was radiant. Quoting Shemoth, chapter 34, verse 29. This is a very powerful and profound statement of the Rashbi in Sefer HaZohar. Here we have Rashbi stating that he is greater than Moshe. Now you have to understand, since the inception of Moshe, all of Judaism considers Moshe to be our, the most greatest divine legislator and prophet that has ever walked the earth. He is the most powerful divine figure that has ever walked the earth since, since, since the time he was born. This is a fact. Now, all of a sudden, here comes a very powerful esoteric text on the scene in Judaism, where we have a figure, these of you Rashbi, stating that he is greater than Moshe. The implications and the ramifications of this are too profound to even begin to explain here. I'll just let the text speak for itself. I'll let history speak for itself. Now, there were many Jews that when they, when they were first initiated and they read this, you better believe the eyes popped out of their sockets. They fell back on their seat as to what they were reading. This would be considered heretical to the vast majority of Orthodox Jews. In fact, we find many of our Grandmaster Kabbalists understanding this, attempting to explain away the implications and ramifications of this folio alone, of this statement of the Rashbi. They have no choice but to try and explain what Rashbi is stating here, even though it is as clear as can be. This is where I lose a little bit of honor and respect for many of these very 
preeminent Grandmaster Kabbalists. Names like Moshe Cordovero and Chaim Vital. If you are fully initiated, and I'm afraid to say as highly initiated as those, and they were probably some of the most highly initiated Kabbalists, we cannot say that they were fully initiated. At least we do not know that because as far as I'm concerned, as far as many of us Kabbalists are concerned, who are fully initiated, who belong to the whole Illuminati, there's no way of knowing of us knowing that they actually believed in Yeshua as Hamashiach. And that they were actually fully initiated as to the great arcane, arcana and secrets behind the redaction of this text and its divine source. Very, very critical to understand. Rashbi is greater than Moshe. Now, if you're initiated, you understand the implications and the ramifications of this, which, by the way, we're going to speak on a little bit here as we proceed. Who is Moshe? Moshe is the greatest prophet that has ever walked the earth since the time of Abraham. Now, speaking on some holy mysteries here, in Gematria, Moshe is equivalent to Shiloh. Now, if you're initiated, you should know that Shiloh is an occult reference to Mashiach. We read in Bereshit in chapter 49, verse 10, it states in the Hebrew, Shiloh Yabo, or Shiloh will come. The gematria of Shiloh will come in the original Hebrew is equivalent to Mashiach. Now, this is very profound because this holy oracle states that the scepter will not depart from Yehuda until Shiloh come. Now, if you read any ancient Jewish commentary, they'll tell you that this is a Messianic oracle, that Shiloh is an occult reference to Mashiach. So we have these very mystical Kabbalistic equations here, right? Moshe is equivalent to Shiloh in Gematria, telling us that Moshe is Mashiach. If you're, you become fully initiated to the Holy Mysteries, that's when you begin to learn some very profound, very, very esoteric mystical Holy Mysteries such as that Moshe is an incarnation of Yeshua or Mashiach, one of many. And the, one of the proofs here being that the gematria of Moshe is that of Shiloh. And Shiloh will come is the same as Mashiach. Now, the oracle, the scepter will not depart from Yehuda. What does that mean? When did the scepter depart from Yehuda? When did Yehuda cease from becoming a polity? Exactly when the second temple was destroyed. The scepter departed from Yehuda and Yehuda ceased from being a polity. It doesn't get any clearer than that. And yet we have so many ignorant, so many spiritual, so many spiritually blind and ignorant Jews that don't even have a basic understanding of this ancient holy oracle. Woe unto them, woe unto them for their ignorance and spiritual blindness. We also read in Sefer Debarim in chapter 18, verse 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like thee, thee being a reference to Moshe. Is this prophet greater than Moshe? Many have taught that he is. A greater incarnation than Moshe. Well, according to the Holy Mysteries, as is, is, is elucidated in Sefer HaZohar, this is the case. And so, just as many have taught that Yeshua was greater than Moshe, here we have Rashbi stating he is greater than Moshe. This is our first critical momentous equation between Rashbi and Yeshua. Because as I have already taught, as I have already stated, as a matter of fact, they are one and the same. Now, we read in Sefer Debarim in chapter 34, verse 5, it states, and Moshe died there by the mouth of Adonai. 
Now, I'm aware of how many English translations translate this, and they are nothing but inferior English translation. This is why it is very critical to learn Hebrew, to penetrate the much deeper levels of the text. Now, the Hebrew that is used there for by the mouth is al P. P in Hebrew is mouth. Now, there are many translations to this Hebrew phrase al P. It's a very mystical phrase, okay? So what does it mean? In many of our ancient commentaries, both esoteric and exoteric, there are numerous mystical commentaries as to the, the implications and the ramifications of this verse, of which there are many. Moshe died there. How did he die? Well, it states Al P by the mouth of Adonai. Some translate it as by the kiss of Adonai, right? It was the mouth of Adonai is how Moshe died which means we call this the kiss of death, a holy kiss of Adonai. When Adonai kisses you, your spirit separates from your body and you ascend. Now, there are so many holy mysteries behind this verse that unfortunately, I don't have the time and space to reveal them all here, okay? Least of which is that Moshe never died. Okay, and I don't even have the time and space to explain and expand upon that super great holy mystery, which, by the way, can be proven through many ways. But essentially here, we have the key phrase here is al P. Moshe was kissed by Adonai. Now, very, very interestingly, we read in Sefer HaZohar, in Parashat Balak, in Book 3, in Folio 201b, it states this, Rashbi said, I have kissed the mouth of Adonai, scented with the spices of his garden. So, in Sefer Debarim, the esoteric mystical understanding is that Moshe, the, uh, the spiritual ascension of Moshe is through a kiss, mouth to mouth, between Moshe and Adonai. Here we have Rashbi stating that he too has kissed Adonai. Now, we don't really know of any other divine figure outside of Moshe who has kissed Adonai other than Rashbi, would you have to be initiated to even know this? Again, here we have another very profound mystical equation between the Rashbi and Moshe, right? We have to understand that there is this very profound mystical equation between Moshe, Yeshua, and Mashiach. And now we can also add to this equation when you are initiated, the Rashbi. This is very, very powerful stuff here. It's a very, very powerful mystical equation. Because here we have another example of Rashbi being greater than Moshe, right? Moshe is kissed by Adonai. Who initiates the kiss? Moshe or Adonai? It's Adonai. Here, Rashbi is initiating the kiss, not the other way around. Going back to our anterior equation, where Rashbi is greater than Moshe. Here is another second powerful and profound example of Rashbi exclaiming and proving that he is greater than Moshe. Again, the implications and the ramifications of this are just beyond, beyond wonderful, beyond amazing beyond staggering, to say the least. Now, we also need to understand that what we are dealing with here are the Gilgulim, or incarnations of Elohim. These are multiple reincarnations of the Elohim. And again, to fully, ex to fully expand upon this is super far beyond the canon scope of this video. Now, let us speak again on this very profound, super esoteric, mystical equation between the Rashbi, Yeshua, and the Mashiach, okay? By looking and analyzing 
at the last three words of of the last words of the death of Rashbi. Okay, now there's this very esoteric section of Sefer Hazohar called the Idra Zuta or the Minor Assembly. Um, as opposed to the Idra Raba, which is the greater assembly. And it is in this esoteric section of Zephyr Hazohar where we witness uh, the death of the Rashbi. Okay? Now, upon the death of Rashbi, this, these are his last words. This is the last thing that Rashbi states right before he dies. He states, Abba, Abba, three there were, into one they have turned, and the companions are all drinking blood. This is very powerful, right? Let's compare this to the final words of Yeshua. The final words of Yeshua were Eli Eli, which is my God, my God. Right? Yeshua, upon his, uh, on his, on, on, or as soon, right before he died, right, he is speaking to his heavenly father. He's addressing his heavenly father. We find the same thing with Rashbi. Right before he dies, he likewise addresses his heavenly father. But unlike Yeshua, he says some very, very profound, very, very mystical things, beginning with three there were into one they have turned, which is a very esoteric allusion to the Holy Supernal Trinity. Something that you only find in Christianity unless you are an initiated Jew like myself. And the companions are drinking blood? Whoa, 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 this is exactly what happened, you know, uh, the night or week before Yeshua's death. His companions, his disciples, were drinking blood. The blood of the grape. Which is a occult allusion to the doctrine of transubstantiation. Right? Per the Torah, the grapes is equal to wine is equal to blood. Right? We find that Yeshua's companions and disciples drunk wine, representing the blood of Yeshua's offering. We have the same thing going on here. We have Rashbi's disciples and companions drinking Rashbi's blood, vis-a-vis wine, right before his death. Because just as with Yeshua, it is his blood, his divine blood, that sustains their vitality and their life. This is very profound. Because, again, what we have here is these are very ancient esoteric Jewish doctrines and teachings very esoteric mystical teachings. They're 100% Jewish. And Christianity, even though many people would, would equate these teachings with Christianity, they're not Christian teachings. These are ancient esoteric mystical teachings. You have to understand that Christianity was founded by Yeshua HaMashiach, who was a highly initiated Jewish Kabbalist, who was proficient and fluent in the ancient esoteric Jewish teachings and mysteries, holy mysteries. And he revealed some of these upon the foundation of this new theosophy called Christianity, which is not a new theosophy. It was really Judaism taken to the next level, but it failed. Failure to launch, I guess you could say, is what happened. Everything is interconnected here. Remember, these holy texts were redacted by the Holy Illuminati in the beginning in the 12th century. They were fully highly initiated. They knew everything about everything. Now let us go to the beginning, literally to the beginning, Breshith, right? If you are fluent in ancient Hebrew and Aramaic, like I am, you understand that the that the first two words of the Torah, which are Breshith Bara, right? They have a very profound holy encrypt. They, they contain very profound holy encryptions, or holy mysteries. Okay, yes, there is the literal level. Breshith Bara may be translated as "In the beginning, He created." It can also be translated as "The beginning created." When you understand the holy esoteric identity of who the quote-unquote beginning is, but on a more esoteric level, if you know Aramaic, you know that the word bara in Aramaic signifies the sun. In Hebrew, bara means he created, but in Aramaic, it signifies the sun. 
knowing this being initiated, you can now read the first two words of the Torah as in the beginning was the sun. Now we read in, in the book of John in chapter one, verse one, he states in the beginning was the word and the word was with Al and the word was Al. Where do you think he got this esoteric holy teaching from? You don't think it was because he was a full-blown initiated Kabbalistic Jew who was fully initiated into the holy mysteries? He would have known this most basic esoteric rendition of the first two words of the Torah. In the beginning was the sun. In the beginning was the word. The sun is the word. He is the logos. The word is Al, which is the logos, which is the sun, which in Hebrew would be Debar or an Aramaic Memra. Now, let us go to a very another profound, super, super deep, profound equation found in Sefer HaZohar, where we find that the Rashbi is equated with the son of Allah. Now, we read in Sefer HaZohar in Parashat Achare Moth, Book 3, Folio 61b, it states, And ever since the day HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the universe, Rab Shimon Bar Yochai has been poised before HaKadosh Baruch Hu and present with him. Of him it is written, Thy father and mother will rejoice, quoting Proverbs chapter 23, verse 25. Thy father is HaKadosh Baruch Hu and thy mother is Shekhinah. Again, principally first understand that these parabolic books of wisdom vis-a-vis -vis the book of Proverbs they're all as I just stated Proverbs allegories when they state thy father and thy mother as a holy initiate and adept you should not be ignorant and dumb enough to think that it's talking about your earthly biological parents we're dealing with divine archetypes here this is a reference to your divine heavenly father and mother, Mizubi Hakadosh Baruch Hu and Shahina. Now, notice what it states here in this in this folio. It's saying Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was poised right before Adonai when he created the entire universe. He was right there with him. This, the implications and the ramifications of this are beyond staggering. We just I just read to you. The book of John, chapter 1, verse 1 to 2. I just gave you an esoteric rendition of the first two words of the Torah. Being initiated, you know that the son of Allah is who created the universe with his father by his side and was with him from the beginning. And yet here we have the folio telling us that this son of Allah, this word, membra or logos, is none other than Rab Shimon Bar Yochai. Now, I have just showcased here to you three mighty powerful examples from Sefer HaZohar, evincing and demonstrating the immense and powerful divinity of Rab Shimon Bar Yochai that he is equated with the son of Allah, with Mashiach, with Moshe, etc. And there are numerous folios demonstrating and evincing the sheer divinity and power and holiness of Rab Shimon Bar Yochai, where if you had read the entire Zohar like I have and you've mastered it, you would know without a shadow of a doubt that Rab Shimon Bar Yochai is Mashiach in the flesh. That's a fact. I don't have the time and space to give you every folio, evincing and demonstrating this. I've just given you three of the most powerful ones that I could, you know, find, find or whatever. Again, let's go, let's go back to the beginning. Exoterically, to any modern or to any Orthodox Jew from the past 2000 years, Rab Shimon Bar Yochai is just another ancient eminent sage, as is recorded in our ancient exoteric Jewish literature. But esoterically, he is Mashiach. He's a code name for Yeshua Bar Yosef, who is Mashiach Ben Yosef. And he has 10 instead of 12 disciples. 
expounding upon ancient Christian mystical teachings first revealed by none other than Yeshua bar Yosef or Mashiach bar Ephraim. This goes back to what I stated in the first video. This book was redacted by the Holy Illuminati, individuals like myself who are highly and fully initiated. Okay? They knew all of this and much more. And they had they had, were on a they had the divine mission to reveal this holy esoteric text for the first time to Judaism. Why? Because the gospel is first to the Jew. Everything is first to the Jew. Yeshua Mashiach was first to the Jew. So it is only fitting that the holy mysteries will be first revealed to the Jew. But you can't tell the Jew who has rejected Yeshua really whose ancestry has rejected Yeshua, they were just born into this condition and state. You can't tell them. You can't write this holy book with the main protagonists being called Yeshua bar Yosef and 12 disciples. You just can't do that. So instead of giving credit where it's due, which is Yeshua bar Yosef and his 12 disciples, we're going to change the names. Instead of telling you who it really is, who this really is, namely Yeshua Bar Yosef, we're going to change the name of Yeshua Bar Yosef to Shimon Bar Yochai. In other words, we're just going to choose a name from one of the ancient eminent sages. In this case, we've raffled off and, and randomly chosen Shimon Bar Yochai, and we'll use that name instead of Yeshua Bar Yosef. And instead of 12 disciples, we're going to change it to 10 disciples. Either way, they're both very highly significant Kabbalistic numbers. So, again, in this video, I decided to actually give you some of the seals, some of the proofs, okay? Because I'm afraid that for most of you who haven't mastered our Midrash, ancient Midrashim and Talmudim, let alone the freaking Sefer HaZohar, my first, my first video may have gone over your head, I'm afraid of, and I, that's, not what I intend, that's not what I intend, that's not what I desire. This is the, one of the most powerful arcanum in this last generation. If you can but understand this, the sky's the limit. For your holy initiation. Now, I want to end by listing a very top-notch good book uh, written by one of our, what I would consider the most eminent scholar. Uh, you know, on literally the most eminent uh, 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 academic scholar uh, on the Kabbalah uh, in this generation, which is a man who goes by the name of Yehuda Leibs, who's actually Israeli, lives in Israel. And he wrote a very, a very powerful, profound book called Studies in the Zohar. It's an academic scholarly book on the Kabbalah. And it was originally written in Hebrew, but there were some other scholars that got it translated into English because this is a masterpiece of academic scholarly work on the Kabbalah. Now, I don't really know, I don't really know Yehuda Leaps too well. In other words, is he, an, is he a religious Orthodox Jew? Is he an, actually, is he an actual spiritual Kabbalist who is initiated into the holy mysteries. I don't really know. Um, you know, I always like, I always usually just state that a lot of these, you know, secular academic scholars on the Kabbalah are just secular. Maybe they're not. I don't really know. I use that term loosely. I could be wrong. Um, you know, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, I, I don't, I don't see him as a, a, a highly initiated spiritual Kabbalist like myself or other real spiritual Kabbalists. So I don't really know. What I do know is he's very, very perspicacious, very objective, and very sagacious as an academic scholar. As such, he has written a very, very critical academic scholarly work on the Zohar, where he reveals some very profound uh, teachings on the Zohar that a lot of modern, quote-unquote, Kabbalistic Jews don't understand, okay? Or, have, or that it has gone over their head due to unfortunate, um, you know, Jewish biases that really shouldn't exist. Okay, now, these, these academic scholars, even though they're not fully initiated into the Holy Mysteries, because they are scholars, because they are very objective, they can reach certain high levels of knowledge and wisdom in regards to the Holy Mysteries. And this book is a good example of this, because in this book, he does a very powerful and good example of explaining many of these powerful connections and equations between the Rashbi and Yeshua. And many of these powerful equations and connections between the, the ancient uh, mystical teachings of Christianity um, and the New Testament and 
and and and and you know the Sefer Hazohar, okay? Because many of the teachings and writings in the New Testament and of ancient, uh, you know, mystical Christianity, guess what? They're all found in Sefer Hazohar. And if you read, if you if you were to read a very well annotated and elucidated uh, translation of Sefer Hazohar, which there does exist, you would find many of these annotations and elucidations cross-reference you know ancient christian works like the new testament okay again the the implications and ramifications of this are very powerful this some of these very preeminent academic scholars on kabbalah are smart enough intelligent and objective enough to understand that these esoteric treatises were written by a group of individuals that belong to the whole illuminati they under they are they are also wise and intelligent and objective enough to understand that much of the core teachings of the holy mysteries uh go back to ancient christianity as was taught and founded by yeshua hamashiach in fact yehuda leaps went on record a number of years ago went on official record in the entire nation of israel teaching and stating as a matter of fact that our core liturgical prayer the amida or the shimone ezra explicitly uh, mentions the name of Yeshua, and it does. And that reference to Yeshua, he says, is a direct explicit reference to Yeshua bar Yosef, Mashiach ben Yosef. This caused a huge uproar in Israel and angered many Orthodox Jews. But they're, they're very ignorant. They're very spiritually blind. They don't know any better. So I highly com commend and praise this book. And I think that for many of you who have not um, mastered our ancient Talmud demon Rishi, who has who has not yet mastered the entire Sefer HaZohar, I think this book would be a good starting point, a good introduction in becoming fully acquainted uh, with this most powerful ancient esoteric principle text, Sefer HaZohar. So with that said, I conclude. Shalom, we amen.